Okay, so the plan for today is to finally join what we did on the server side with what we did on the client side, okay? So we'll break the barrier and let the React application be able to call the APIs uh, that we developed on the server, okay? So that's the plan. And uh, the key <laughs> ingredient for this plan is uh, a possibility for a JavaScript application on the client to be able to call an API through an, 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 an HTTP request uh, to a different server, okay, to a server somewhere. And this uh, is possible through a function which is called fetch. Hmm? So first of all, let's start with that. Um, what we want to be able to uh, make some requests in our JavaScript code on the browser, okay? In, uh, the word here is in an asynchronous way, of course. Meaning that uh, these kind of requests will go in parallel with the, or independently from the loading and the visualization of the page, of the web page. Okay, uh, of course a browser is able to do an HTTP request. You just need to navigate to a different link and the browser will issue a get. Or you just need to submit a form and the browser will issue a post. But these are the side effects that the page is destroyed, okay? So what we want to do is to be able to make a get or a post or whatever request while staying on the same page. So in background, in our code, okay? The idea is that uh, we, are, we have uh, two applications, one running on the server, one running on the client. The application running on the server, we already had that uh, since the beginning of the course, uh, is something that runs uh, in, uh, in Node, uh, it runs uh, uh, with Express, and we define a set of routes, okay, on the server, and this Express routes uh, uh, map different APIs. Okay, uh, it's done. We know we, we try to do that uh, by hand uh, to call the different APIs and see how they are able to provide some data or to modify or add some data on the back end. Okay, this is done. And on the other hand, we uh, know how to uh, create. A React application with components uh, and with uh, some state, uh, and we are able to evolve the state and so on. But uh, uh, for the moment, uh, the React application only works uh, on its own data. So whatever you do is lost uh, because there's no persistence. When you reload the application, all the information is lost. Okay? And uh, also, the React application doesn't have any information from outside the world. Hmm? Uh, what we want to add here is some capability from the client application to be able to call the server, one of the APIs offered by the server, so that, for example, the list of questions can be retrieved by the server, from the server, by the client from the server. So the, the client, when we render the page with the list of questions, instead of relying on a, you know, a, a JavaScript array that you just put into the code, we'll remove this, let's say, um, uh, static uh, information, and we load them from a server. We have an API for getting the list of questions. We have an API for getting the list of answers for a specific question, and so on. We have all the APIs for reading and managing uh, this data, okay? Uh, the, the trick is how can we call this, this operation from a React application? And uh, we the journey is made of three different steps. First, we need to uh, understand how the JavaScript language handles that. Second, how to integrate this into a React application, specifically because uh, React, has a, we, we already know, a very, very specific uh, uh, management of the components. So you can just call an API when you want, especially if this is asynchronous and it could interact in some way with the states of the component, with the rendering. So we need to um, find a way that in which React can accommodate for external asynchronous operations. Okay, right now we uh, did everything in a 
very functional way plus the management of the state that we delegated to the uh, use state hook. So first we learn fetch, and then we learn how to uh, a fetch which is a synchronous, uh, an asynchronous operation, how to integrate that in a functional structure uh, like, like React. And the third step uh, is uh, to make the server aware that it will, be a, uh, it will receive requests from our application. Okay. Um, in, uh, uh, in React, uh, we will learn uh, now for the integration of, uh, of asynchronous operation, of reason calls in, in, a, re in a React uh, environment, uh, we learn uh, today a new hook, uh, a very important one, which is called user effect. Okay? But let's start from the beginning. Uh, how to uh, activate an HTTP request from the browser? And the function for doing that is called fetch. Hmm? Um, is uh, quite simple. Huh? It gets uh, one parameter with the URL that we want to ask, plus uh, an object that is uh, through which we can uh, customize the request, okay? For example, specify the method, specify, specify additional headers, and so on, okay? Um, so, that's a, the fetch is a function for doing a get, or for doing a post, or a put, or whatever you want. We just learned how to set the parameters of the function. Fetch is an asynchronous operation, and therefore it will return a promise, okay? So let's just remember what promises are from the beginning. Rewind a bit your brain. And uh, uh, so that it returns immediately with a promise object uh, that we can wait on. So, so we can do a then on this object uh, for uh, waiting for, for processing the results of the call. Or we can do an await statement, uh, which is the same as then, just uh, no. uh, syntactically is uh, more convenient. And the promise will resolve to a different object, which is called a response object. Okay? So when the call is, success is successful, so we don't have any error, any connection errors, or something like that, uh, we have a response object that contains uh, the, uh, the response from the server. So actually, again, we are in the request response uh, paradigm of uh, HTTP. The request, now we are making the request, and we are making it by specifying the parameters of fetch. Then we are waiting for the request to go through, go to the server, being processed by the server, coming back with our, an HTTP response, and when this response arrives, the uh, promise is unlocked, is fulfilled with an object of type response. Okay, so we need to learn the response object that we need to uh, analyze, no? to extract, from which we need to extract information. The promise is always, nearly always uh, fulfilled, and it's only rejected if we have a network error. That means uh, the address is uh, uh, invalid, or the, the, the host is invalid, or the connection is lost, or the timeout errors, and so on. If the connection succeeds, the uh, promise is always fulfilled, even if we are throwing an error. Remember that on the server side, some APIs will throw an error, or 404 error, or, or 500 error, whatever, okay? These error codes are not, uh, do not cause uh, the rejection of the promise. Some, these error calls will return a normal promise, a normal, sorry, response, in which we can read the code. So we'll see in a moment uh, that we need to handle you know, uh, error cases in two different steps. First, network errors. Second, application errors. Hmm? Okay, sorry, I forgot to disable some distractions. This one. Okay, so 
In the simplest case, we have a fetch with a URL that, oh, let's read the, the way it's the one on the right. They are equivalent to the one, the first, the one on the left, we are in the one on the left, we are using then, and the one on the right, we are using uh, await, okay? Just for handing the promise. But the instruction is the same. We are fetching a URL. Fetching means, uh, by default, uh, issuing a, a get request, okay? So get this address. Get doesn't have anybody on their request, so that's it, okay? And uh, the execution of fetch will start the request. We tell the browser, please start a request. And uh, when the request uh, goes through and comes back and the response comes back, uh, the promise is uh, fulfilled, and so we can catch the response in a then statement in a then callback, or we can say the response after awaiting for the response. It's the same. In both cases, in this constant response, we have an object of type response, with capital R. R. And uh, this object can, from this object, we can extract some information. For example, the response object has a method called JSON that will parse the response body assuming that it contains some JSON format and return a JavaScript object. Okay, so normally we get something, we having a return a response with a body in JSON format. This body is stored into the response object. If we, can, if we call the JSON method, which also returns a promise, so we need to await, um, we can store the data in, in, as objects, directly as objects, not a string. The, the JSON is already parsed by, go away, uh, parsed by, by the library, okay? So what is a response object? It's an object that contains uh, some properties. Um, one useful property, okay, the sta uh, status, is the number, so 200, 404, 505, and whatever. Uh, or, and the status text is coming from the HTTP response. So we can read the status of the response. Or uh, it's easier, we have, we have a property called OK, which is already true if the status is in the range, in the 200 range. Okay? So we don't need to check for the ranges. Uh, uh, Response.ok will already tell me whether we have a success uh, a re a response uh, code. Then we have, of course, property for extracting the headers and uh, a, pro a property for extracting the body of the response. Okay? Uh, the body is in the form of a stream, so we need to, to, uh, to decode this stream. But uh, uh, this is an example of what we have uh, when we do uh, a fetch and we analyze the response, response.headers. Uh, headers is a, is a dictionary, basically, key value dictionary. So we have the, it has a, a get method for extracting uh, the different headers. So for example, the content type in, case, in this case was application HTML. The date was... Uh, this date here. The status is a number, and, uh, and so on, okay? So we can extract uh, after we, we complete the, the fetch, we can extract the response and extract different information, but uh, um, the body is, uh, is a bit more complex because we can not it's not just a string, it's not just a value. Um, Error handling, so as you said, uh, we have two different levels of uh, possible errors. The first uh, is a network problem. So we could not receive a response from the server for many reasons, basically network issues. In this case, uh, uh, the promise is rejected. So we can catch the error as an exception or as a, as a catch made, as, a, as a, by specifying a catch callback in the promise. Or uh, we have uh, an HTTP error, so a code which is not in the range 200, 
that means uh, some kind of error, and then that we, in that case, it will fulfill the promise, but the status code uh, will not be okay. Okay, so okay will be, will be false. And so uh, we have uh, uh, different levels. If the response is fulfilled, check for okay. If not okay, then do something because we have some application error or whatever. And in any case, uh, provide a catch uh, for other type of errors. This is an example of using then. We try, uh, and when we have the two cases, the uh, net, we have net, net, network problems, and we manage them in the catch clause. Or we don't have network problems, but the request generated an error, maybe you know, some data was invalid or duplicate key when you're trying to insert something, so the kind of error that we saw in our APIs. And so in this case, we test for response.ok. Otherwise, of course, you could also have other types of uh, problems, uh, uh, like uh, the, the data is not valid or the header, and, but this uh, will be more application specific. Uh, depends on what you are really expecting. So this is the, just remember, it can, the, the, the fetch could be okay, so it could be, uh, for being valid, uh, it, we must be in the then clause and with okay equal to true. That's for a simple get. Now, if we just need to make a get uh, of a URL, that's it. Uh, we make the get, we wait for the response, and we analyze the response object. If we need to modify or customize or to make different kinds of requests, uh, we use the second parameter of the fetch uh, function, the so-called init object. So the first one is always there, the URL. And the second one could be an object that specifies some details about the request to be done, okay? How the browser should compose the request to the server. First of all, the method, of course. By default, it was get, but if we want to issue a post or a put or a delete, we must specify the method. So this object could have a property method, post, method, put, whatever. We can provide some headers. Maybe we need to specify the content type. If we are sending a body with in JSON format in the header section of the request, we must have a content type. Remember, we tied those, those information by hand when we created the, the HTTP tests, okay? And so we need also to provide them in the, in the object. And possibly a body. So in the case we are issuing a post or a put, we need to provide a body encoded in some way in which, uh, that we specify in the headers, okay? And so the body also should be provided as a string, basically. And plus other type of, uh, of properties that, uh, but the three most important ones are highlighted here. So, Another example, uh, we want to make a post of, a, of an object. So imagine the object is this one, object to send, that contains uh, strings, uh, booleans, uh, and uh, arrays, uh, whatever. This is the, is the instruction for issuing a post. We have the URL of the server, of the API server, and then the second parameter is an object, and in this object, we specify these three property, methods, headers, and body. Method will be post, in this case, and the body would be the JSON string corresponding to the object. The body property must be a string that is sent, and we must encode the string, and we must encode the string, uh, the object as a string, and normally we are using JSON for doing that. So that's on us, okay, it's not automatic. And uh, for the server to be able to interpret the request body in JSON format, we should tell in the headers, we should add to the headers uh, the content type uh, 
line with application JSON form. Okay, so headers uh, on itself is another object that contains many properties, key value properties, uh, that are translated into different headers that are printed in the, in the request. Okay, so we are not building uh, the headers as strings. We are providing key value to be used for constructing these headers. Okay, so it's also easier to, 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 to have some expressions to build uh, the strings and so on. So this is a template for, for issuing a post. We send it and then, of course, we wait for the, re for the result uh, with the then or catch uh, or the await uh, for the result of the post. Remember that uh, on the server side, uh, uh, when we receive a request in JSON format, uh, the JSON middleware in Express uh, requires this, uh, uh, this header to be activated. Okay? Remember the, the body.json is available only if the request has the correct header. Okay, so just remember the, the games we did. So uh, now we are building the requests that, that are planned, uh, that we already planned when we designed the server. And uh, the response body can be read basically with two methods. Okay, there are others, but the two most important ones are dot .text or dot .body, or dot .json, sorry. Uh, these text and JSON are asynchronous methods also. They are, uh, so they return a promise. So we should await on those, okay, if we want to extract the data. So uh, re uh, await uh, response.text will give me the body of the response as a string. Uh, await response.json will give me a JavaScript object uh, that is built by parsing the body of the response in assuming JSON format. Okay? And normally, if you have only maybe a message or a number, or whatever, we, just, we can just extract it with text, but in more complex cases, uh, we will have probably a JSON. We, of course, we need to know which is the format of the response to be able to read it. Um, this is asynchronous uh, because the response may be long, Okay, maybe of several kilobytes or whatever, and so the response object doesn't wait until everything is loaded. The headers are available immediately, so you can process them immediately. And then if you need the body, you can ask the, the, um, the response object to decode the body for you, but maybe the body is still, still loading. So that's why it returns a promise. It doesn't... Uh, uh, the response object uh, doesn't wait for the full body to be loaded in cases in which it's, it's, it's large, of course. In many cases, it will be small. That's the reason why they also return a promise. Hmm? They don't return a string. Uh, the other catch is that since the body is received from the network, it's not stored anywhere. So these methods can only be called once. Once you call JSON, it will wait for, the, for it, uh, parse it, return an object, uh, and then forget about the request body. So if you call JSON a second time, I don't remember if you get a, an empty string or, or an error. Hmm? But you shouldn't do that. So only call them once. Uh, because you are consuming a stream, so once the string is read, it's gone. Um, so, the easiest way is, use, of course, to using a wait at every step. A wait fetch, and then we have the response. If we want to extract the value, a wait response to JSON, and we get an object. If we need to do something with this object, maybe we have the list of users, that we pick a first one, and we know we want to extract some information about the user. We can add the second fetch, of course when, the, in this case, we are building an API request uh, with a specific uh, pattern, uh, user slash one, or whatever. So we are uh, 
issuing a second fetch uh, whose content depends on the result of the first one. Of course, we are sequentializing everything, okay, with the awaits. Start the query and then wait for the response. When the response is back, extract the JSON, wait, go to sleep, and then come back when the JSON is ready, build the URL and issue a second get, and so on. But with the await syntax, everything is linear to read. Remember that every time we call await, but the, this function is suspended until the response is uh, fu hopefully fulfilled. Okay? And in the reality, we should have all this block inside a try-catch block to manage uh, errors. And also here, the response before extracting response.json, we should check if response.ok okay, uh, and handle all the special cases. Uh, but this is just for, for showing the sequence of, of operations. Um, okay. Then we have added details, so if you have a lot of, uh, of, um, of data to load, we can also create a, um, an array of promises and, uh, and use promise.all to run them in parallel, but this is just normal promise handling. But, uh. So this is the basics. So with that, uh, what can we do? We could start with the first step of the exercise that we are proposing today is uh, create a simple web page, okay, using HTML and plain JavaScript, so let's forget for uh, React for the moment, and uh, use it to fetch some uh, information, for example, the list of all questions, uh, and put them into a web page. Okay, so let's go back on the, let's work on the browser with basic JavaScript, okay, just to see how fetch works. And then next step, we'll try to integrate that into React. So what did they do? I just copied one uh, version of the server. OK, we have server.js here that implements uh, a lot of APIs. It's a version that we did after the classes, so it's more polished with all the methods, all the validation, and so on, okay? That we had in week number four or five, something like that. It's a polished version, it's called QL Server, and we can run it. So we open a terminal on this address, and then we start it. Okay, the server is running. What we did in week uh, four and five was to test the server by issuing some uh, test calls. Remember, we have an HTTP file when we could, for example, send a request for getting the list of all the questions. You send a request, we get uh, some JSON object in the response. Oh. So this is something that we already have. Our goal now is to call this API from an HTML page. Okay, so let's leave the, uh, the um, server running and, wo and work on a client. So I prepared a, uh, just a folder with an empty index file. The only instruction here is uh, loading a script. All the rest is empty. And uh, we have uh, an, an app.js uh, that only prints page loaded, so something empty. Hmm? And we can work on that to, for maybe doing in the uh, HTML, uh, we can uh, have a button called, uh, you know, load questions. And when this button is clicked, uh, then we load and display the list of questions on the page. Okay? So we can, on the front end, we can have... Uh, Forget about the, uh, the styles, the CSS, the bootstrap, just no, basically we can have one paragraph that contains a button uh, with uh, load questions and another div the, in which we are going to load uh, the list of questions, for example. 
it will be empty and then we load something, okay? Uh, let's write something here that we are going to replace. Okay, so this looks like, uh, do we have a folder open here? Yes, it looks like this. Okay, so we want, okay, we, saw, we see in the console that uh, the JavaScript already loaded the page loaded event. Okay, so we want to attach to the load questions button the, um, fetch to the get. Hmm? Um, okay. First of all, we are we are now we work in the in Diablo.js. Oh sorry. First it's better to have some uh, maybe ID equal to load button. And the div, uh, let's give an ID of uh, list, question list, for example. Okay, so that we can refer them easily in the JavaScript. So, first of all, should uh, uh, attach an event handler, click handler to the button. So we find the button, remember what we did uh, before react document dot uh, uh, um, for example query selector or get element by ID in this case we have the ID so maybe it's faster get element by ID and we find the ID with the, uh, I already forgot how I called it uh, load button. And from this button, that we assume is there, we attach an event listener to the click event, where we can plan some action. Okay? So here, we are here on button click. Okay, let's test it. just to be sure. Okay, click on a button, something appears in the console. So we are there. Hmm? Um, okay, of course we don't want to log this. We want to issue a fetch. So let's just copy what we saw in the slides. We want to fetch from uh, the URL called, uh, oh, we have it in the, the example. In the test of HTTP, we know that the URL to get is this one. We just tested it, it's, it's working, it's running, okay? So we go to app.js, we fetch this address. This will return a promise that will return resolve to the response object. So, response, we can get it from awaiting for, for the fetch, for the result of the fetch. Of course, await is a syntax error here because we must, the containing function should be a sync if we want to be able to use await, but it's not a problem, we just need to declare the event tender as an async function, which only means that the function returns a promise instead of a value, okay? And enables to use a syncing side, uh, a waiting side. So it's an async event tender that will issue a fetch, and then we can extract once, uh, let's assume that everything is right, so we don't do error management for the moment. We can extract uh, 
the data, so the list of questions, from uh, our um, response.json. We assume that this response will have a body, and this body is uh, encoded in JSON format. Just beware, if I write like that, uh, questions would be the a promise, would not be a value. So if I really want the value, I should await uh, for the decoding of the JSON. It's a, quite a common mistake, to for, for, at least for me, to forget this uh, second await statement. Uh, and then when I expect to have an object, I have a promise. Uh, and when I try to read some properties, I don't find them, of course. Mm -hmm. OK, once we have the question, which is an object, we can maybe just uh, put that into the, the, the div. Then we can also uh, iterate over this. Uh, but let's just for the moment say that we want to write uh, in the box uh, the number of questions. We have two questions, for example, uh, this kind of sentence. So it's easy, we just we have to uh, find the div, document, dot get element by id. And the ID was uh, question list. And this is a, um, a DOM node. We can set the inner text of this node to a string that we choose. For example, we have a, a given number of questions. Sorry. Uh, questions dot size. Questions. Right? Is size the, the, the property for arrays? Yes. OK, we just write that, OK? We expect that when we click the button, a call to the server is done, and uh, the result uh, will be in this. Uh, and we know that the question are two. We just tested it here. Let's test it again. The response should be this one. It's an array of objects, of two objects. OK, so this response that we are testing by hand will be available, if everything is OK, in this questions object. The question will be an array of two objects. OK, so let's try it. We click on load questions, and something is wrong here. We have undefined questions. Uh, and so the response was, oh, OK, the object was there. So I did something wrong. Uh, let's say just, sorry. OK, so it's not uh, length, not size, sorry. OK. And then, of course, we can uh, also print the list of questions here. So we have one local page, basically, which is, contains a JavaScript code that issues some calls to the server. Uh, maybe if we want uh, to add more information, we could also maybe iterate over the questions. So for example, for, and this is normal code at, the, at this moment, nothing special, for question of questions. We can, I don't know, print some, print the name of each question by adding that to the, 
So let's uh, do this uh, one. So maybe let's put that into HTML. We'll put this into a paragraph. Sorry. And then we are we here we are just in in the manipulation of the DOM. Maybe sorry. Let's just remember this div. Const div is this one. And then we can append the div dot. Uh, what can we do? We can append. We need a DOM of, oh, sorry, uh, it's, it's the, uh, again, it's the boring part. Uh, we could just append to the inner HTML, for example, plus uh, with something like uh, the question dot name, question, Q, Q dot, what was the name of the attribute uh, text? The text may be included into some paragraph. And this should sorry, reload. Uh, Did I do something here? That question, but it's not. Uh, sorry. Let's debug a bit. Ah, stupid me. The nice thing of developing the browser that always is that you don't you don't see the error messages. Hmm? Okay. So this is the idea. We, it was just a simple um, fetch, and we, are, we don't want we don't want to go forward too much on this because we are hating a bit the DOM manipulation for modifying the page. Just remember that in React is much easier, and that's why we prefer a framework rather than direct manipulation. Okay, but the idea, uh, all the all the core is here. We have uh, an event handler that, for some reason, needs uh, to call an API. So calling that is just as easy as issuing a fetch, and then managing the result. So actually. Everything is in these two lines here. Of course, to make it error proof, we should add a couple of uh, statements for error handling. So, for example, putting all of this into a try catch block. So, all of that. Catch uh, the uh, the exception, and I don't know what to do, but for sure it's a network error. And this catch will basically catch the uh, exception thrown by this uh, fetch. Okay. And the second test we should do is also if uh, testing, if response is okay. If it's okay, then we can do the rest. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, uh, we have some error in the response, okay? 
So we can say console.log uh, HTTP error code, and we can extract that from uh, response the status. And of course, depending on the status, some different things may happen. Right now, we don't know what to do where we have an error, but. Okay, so it should run normally again. But if, for example, we shut down the server, so I interrupt the server, I try to do, to call it again. Of course, I should, I have some time to wait uh, no, because uh, the request uh, should time out and then the server will tell me network error. Okay? If we, if we, if we run again, probably... It works okay. Okay? Okay, so that's the, the basics. Now we need to put this into a wider context in which we are, we see how this scales uh, for a client and the server applications. And uh, let me make a test, uh, just, I'm not sure, but uh, let me just change in the server the port number. Changing the port and, of course, changing it in the, in the application. Yes. So what did I do? I changed uh, because my browser has, some, has already some cache some permissions. So let's start from scratch. Um, I, I built an HTML application with a JavaScript code that calls this API. This API is correct, okay? I can test it. The server is running. I can test it with, of course, uh, the right URL because now it's running on port 3002. And if I send a request, it's okay. Okay, so I just moved the server from 3001 to 3002. But now, the application is not working anymore. And it give me a strange error. And this error is cross origin request blocked. The same origin policy this allows reading the remote resource. Okay, so we need to understand what it means and how and what we can do against it. Basically what uh, is telling us and then we say the details is that uh, this server, oh sorry, why should this server accept a GET request from me? Does it know me? Does every, any a, API server in the world accept a request from any web page in the world? Well, maybe not. And in fact, by default, uh, the browser integrates uh, a policy which is called the same origin policy. And the same origin policy says that uh, a browser can make, uh, sorry, a server will accept uh, a request with fetch from a JavaScript code that was loaded from the same site. So if I have a website, x.com, that contains an HTML page that loads some JavaScript code from x.com, then that JavaScript code is authorized to call the APIs on x.com. That code is by default not authorized to call APIs from y.com. 
unless y.com allows it. So this is a protection. I have an API, and this API can only be called by code that I gave you. Because the JavaScript that you are running in the browser was delivered by my website. So I was responsible for the JavaScript that you're running, and so it will accept remote calls, API calls from that JavaScript, which is mine, basically. But if I give you some JavaScript code, my code cannot, uh, by default, access APIs from other websites, which is also true in the other way. People running other web applications cannot call my APIs unless I authorize them in some way. So same policy means that uh, fetch can be done only on the same website and port from which uh, the JavaScript was loaded. Same origin, same of what? Same origin from the, the origin of the JavaScript and the origin, the address of the fetch. These two should match, at least in the um, protocol, HTTP or HTTPS, host and port. These three should match. Of course, the URL, the address are different. Okay, so in practice, in practice, we are trying to understand how to manage, or we are touching for the first time, the so-called two-servers problem. Hmm? Uh, right now, we don't have two servers. Uh, we just have one file <laughs> on my computer and a server, an API server. Okay? But it's the same. We see that the problem uh, also appears. So let's put a bit of context. Um, so. We have the browser that runs a React application. And this React application, we see in a moment how we can do that, calls fetch. OK. But the React application doesn't, is not born in the browser. When we load the application for the first time, we are loading the application from the server. npm run dev. We are starting a web server locally on port 5173, right? And this web server will basically be only used once to load the initial page. But this means that the HTML and especially the JavaScript in our React application is coming from that web server, the React development server in this case. React development server is the one run with this command and contains all the JavaScript code for my React components. Of course, these React components are not executed here, are just transferred there, and they are run there in the browser. But this JavaScript code comes from this web server. Okay? The React development server, or maybe under, an other, another server where we install the React application. And then this fetch wants to call, OK, so the Red Web server, just as not, doesn't run Express. It's not my web server. It's the development server. You cannot customize it. You cannot add some routes or whatever. It's just there for serving the React components. But then my application, once it's running, and so we forgot about uh, the initial fetch, the initial get of the uh, application start, wants to call an API from another API server which uh, is just running in Node in Express with some routes from uh, some APIs. Okay, so we have a second server. And these two servers are running in parallel on two different hosts uh, or two different ports uh, of the same host. One for giving, for delivering the React application and second for executing the API calls. And so, this is the API, the express that we know, all the, uh, the API server, and the fetch is going to call this. And this is where we have a problem. That this fetch is, wants to call an API from a server that is different from the server from which this code was downloaded. And this is against uh, 
the policy. But the two are incompatible because while the first one, the React application server, doesn't allow me to write my code to handle different routes, on the other hand, the expert server doesn't understand React at all. So we cannot just move React application to this website or move to the API to the other server. These are different. And uh, they should be alive at the same time, but they run on different ports, different servers. Okay? So how to handle that? Uh, well, there are different possibilities, okay? One possibility, the, one, the, the easiest one is let's keep these two servers and try to allow uh, JavaScript downloaded from the first server to call APIs on the second server. So configure the policy, the course, course stands from cross origin, I don't remember what, resource. Uh, so we need to handle this sort of block that the server is, going, is, is giving us. But, but actually, the, the, the block is from the browser, not from the server. It's the browser itself that refuses to do these calls. Or another solution at, that we usually adopt uh, when we are deploying the application for real is to try to bundle everything into one server. This is more complex, but it can be done by um, taking the React application and creating a an so-called application bundle, so only static files, JavaScript and uh, HTML, and putting them into a folder into a static folder of Express, of my Express application. So uh, Express doesn't understand JSX, Express doesn't understand React, but if it sees some HTML and JavaScript files in the static folder, it's happy to serve them over. It doesn't care. In the static, can, can, they can be whatever. Hmm? And so this is what we are going to do, uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, let's convert uh, the React, the, all the application into, at the end of the day, is just some files. Uh, to create some of these static files, we need to take all the JSX code and convert it into normal JavaScript. Uh, all the import statements uh, and convert them to require uh, all the uh, imports of CSS or images and convert them into links. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to convert uh, the code that we write in React to the actual code that can run in Express or in the browser. And this is called bundling of the application. So we download the libraries that we need, the function that we need, we resolve all the syntax sugar and so on. And this is something that you do before releasing the application. Huh? Uh, there's a command for uh, creating a bundle of, of your application. You, are only, will, you will get one directory with files that can be copied everywhere for distributing the application. That can be copied to any web server because they don't need any um, server-side uh, operations. They are just files, okay? So nobody prevents me from storing these files in the same server that is already hosting the API. In this case, we don't have any problem with, with the cross-origin because the origin is only one, okay? This is not very convenient in development mode because every time we modify something, we should recreate the bundle and recopy it into the folder. And it's a time-consuming operation. It takes minutes, a couple of minutes to do the bundle and the copy and so on, and restart in the server and so on. So in development mode, it's easier to have two separate servers running. We work on the server, we work on the client. They are both on my computer, but we should always be very aware of what is running on the server and what is running on the, on the client. When I'm editing a file, it's on one side or the other, of, because we are develop, actually developing two applications at the same time, independent applications. Hmm. One is the API server and the other is the React application. Um, okay, so in this case, 
this is the configuration that we want to use. In development mode, it's easier. And uh, the, how can we, so this means that uh, the fetch that we do will uh, need to access a different origin, a server with a different origin for what we have. And we can do that by conf uh, configuring this, oh, this written, cross-origin resource sharing. So I want to share my resources even to some client uh, which is cross-origin. So it's not the same origin. It's a, from a different origin. And so we can, every web server can declare which are the other origins, so the other websites, from which is willing to accept the, the request. Um, it's, uh, of course, uh, the configuration, of course, uh, is uh, very versatile. You can specify statically or dynamic, dynamically the websites. Uh, you can check the authentication before authorizing and so on. There's a lot of stuff there. But uh, in development mode, in development mode, only, okay, we can say, okay, let's forget about it. Let's allow everything. Okay, there's a, in, 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 um, in Express, we have a middleware which is called course, guess why, um, that we can install as a middleware in Express. And uh, the parameters of this course function will specify which websites are allowed, which are denied, and so on. Right? It's a very complex or complex, versatile, complete configuration. If we don't want to provide any configuration, we can just say, let everybody through. Which for development uh, is okay, but remember, if you need to go into production, don't leave it there, okay? Because otherwise everybody will be able to call your, your function, mm -hmm. your API. But this will, enable us to go forward uh, with, uh, with our exercise, at least. And so the idea is that uh, uh, we modify the server to accept requests uh, from any origin. For doing that, we must install the course. So we are, I'm on the server here, npm install course. That is a middleware from Express. Okay, once it's installed, okay, I can rerun my application. And uh, I need to add as a middleware. So app.user course. And course is a function that I import from uh, the course module, course uh, from Okay, so with these two modifications, importing course and configuring course to let everybody through, probably my application is now working. At least uh, will not be blocked by course. So I've, if I click on load question now, I didn't modify the client. I didn't even reload the client. And now it's working. It's not blocked anymore. And this is normal, OK? I, I was able to do, the, to do the exercise before because I, the course information was cached in my browser. I did before, and then I, I put the course before on page, uh, on port 3001, and then removed it. <laughs> for doing the exercise and then not having, not having to deal with all the problems at once. But it's, the normal would be if you try to do a fetch, you will receive a course error, hmm? even on port 3001. Now the browser knows this information. By the way, how does it know? It knows uh, thanks to the response headers. The response headers. Access, control, allow, origin, anything. This header has been put into the response 
by our middleware here. So the server is declaring, I will uh, enable any origin to call my APIs. And so the browser says, okay, I'm part of that, I could go forward, I'm not blocked. In the other cases, when we got the error, there was no header of that type. Okay, so the other name is very strange, access control allow origin. It means the same as course, as cross origin. The name of the header doesn't match really <laughs> the, the, the type of the error, so it's not easy to see at the first sight. So we are adding in the response this header that enables the, the, the client to make a request. By the way, course works in two different ways. One for get and the other for post uh, methods. In a get method, if I try to do a get to a website, to a server where I'm not authorized, I simply get an error. Uh, what was that? Like before, an exception, okay? A network error. Before get is not dangerous in any case, okay? If it goes through or not, uh, we say it's, it's idempotent, it doesn't change the data. So we can try it, if it works okay, if it doesn't work, we get an error. But with a post, it's more dangerous, because uh, uh, issuing a post and not knowing whether it will, be, will go through or not uh, may potentially modify some, da some data or not, uh, and they don't know where, uh, the, which is the case. Okay, so in, in case of, uh, uh, HTTP methods that modify the data, like post, uh, the browser does a double step. We'll see next week uh, when we do that in React. Uh, the server will do, uh, sorry, the browser will do two calls. One is called a pre-flight check. Pre-flight, before the flight. Uh, the server, if I try to do a fetch with a the, with the post method, this, the browser will first send a small request, say, okay, e asking, if I, may, if I make a post, will it be okay? And if the server says, e yes, it's okay according to, the, to the, the origin policies, then the browser will do the post. So for every post, actually the browser will do two calls. One is a pre-flight saying, okay, uh, will you allow me if I do a post? And then we'll, the real post will follow. And in that case, it will not be rejected because the server just said it's okay to send it. So the browser will check before doing that. And so you will see many additional requests uh, uh, in your network panel, okay? We will see them. Hmm? Not with guests. Guests are easy, and so they either succeed or give an error, an access error. Okay, so it's a, just to say that the course uh, protocol is quite complex, it's quite articulated, but uh, we are just shortcutting it by saying, okay, we want to develop, uh, let's forget about that, uh, let's allow everything. Okay, so that's our first step. We were able uh, here to create a simple application, fetch some data, display that in the, in, uh, in the page, and then, of course, we had to set up cores in the server to make this happen, okay? So we are now ready for the next step, so how to do all of this inside React. And the issue is that inside React, of course, we don't have the direct control of the DOM. We can do anything of this kind. Huh? Because the rendering is not something that we do by modifying the DOM, but the render is something that the React does by calling the function components. Uh, uh, and so we must, uh, in a way, schedule the execution of some asynchronous operation, and when this operation completes, uh, we will update the state, uh, and the state update uh, will cause the re-render. 
okay? So there will be some external force that uh, will change my state, some external event, and in the language of reality is called some external effect, side effect. Something that happens outside the reactor, you know, a side effect, uh, will affect in some way the state. So that's the topic for the next hour after the break. Okay? When we learn about use effect and how to use the use effect hook for issuing API calls. And the server is always there. Now it's configured with course. I will bring it back to port 3001 just for avoiding confusion. And then now we move on to, on to the React side. Okay. Have a nice break.